welcome to the Backup Punter Podcast. My name is Keegan Matheson here with you for episode number four, and today it's all about the NFL Draft. Just over two weeks until the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are on the clock in Chicago, and we're going to start out by looking at my top five prospects at each position on offense. Thank you for joining again for episode number four of the Backup Punter Podcast. No matter where you are in the world, I thank you for taking 45 minutes, an hour out of your day to join each and every week to listen, to discuss NFL football. You can find us now on iTunes. Search up the Backup Punter Podcast. Subscribe to it. You'll get it sent right to you each and every week when it does release. You can also find us on Stitcher if you're an Android user. And then on Twitter and Facebook, both at the Backup Punter. Reach out anytime if there's a question you have for the show, if there's something you want to have discussed. I'll do my best to get to it on the podcast. And that's the best part of this show is when you do interact. If you've got a prospect in mind, if you've got an NFL story, a free agent, send me a tweet right over Facebook and we'll get to it. So I thank you again for joining. And this week is all about the 2015 NFL Draft. And with the draft just over a couple weeks away, that really slows down the NFL news cycle in terms of free agency trades. Pretty much all of that's put on the back burner until draft day right now. So now it's all about visits. It's all about private workouts. It's all about rumors that are 98% smoke screens, but that's the beauty of it. So today we're going to go position by position on offense, and we're going to look at my top five prospects. Maybe at wide receiver, I'll do a top 10, because that's a great wide receiver class. But of course, we're going to start out here at quarterback. And although it pains me to do it, I've got to have Jameis Winston as my number one quarterback. Jameis Winston out of FSU, he's 6'4", 231. Nothing wrong with his body. 2014, he completed 65% of his passes. Here's where I have an issue. 25 touchdowns, fantastic. 18 interceptions. And the college season is shorter than the NFL season. That's a lot of interceptions. But he does have good mobility. It's functional mobility. This guy isn't Marcus Mariota. He's not going to scramble for 30 yards. But if an edge rusher comes around the edge, he can shuffle up. He can shuffle back. And that's what makes someone like a, you know, like a Tom Brady so good. He's slow as hell. But if somebody's coming after him, he knows how to take that quick step and get out of danger. Plant his feet and throw. Jameis Winston can do that. He's 26-1 and one at FSU. That's fantastic. Does that mean he's going to take losing very well in the NFL? I don't know. But he's also coming from a pro-style offense. So many of these quarterbacks you see coming out of college now are in these all-out offense schemes. And that hurts them coming into the league. Jameis Winston comes from a pro-style under Jimbo Fisher. Now, the big worry with him is the off-field stuff. You've heard all about it. I won't bore you with it. My worry is that this has all been a show. Go back to January 1st. Look at some, you know, some mock drafts or rankings from then. He was really being questioned. Marcus Mariota was a lot of people's number one QB then. He still is for a few people, but Jameis Winston seems to have put on this act over the last few months when the cameras are on. And I'll admit, he's extremely charismatic. He's got the million dollar smile. He's laughing. He goes on. But I don't care about that because he knows people are watching. Do I trust that he's going to be this person for the next 10, 15 years? I'm really hesitant to. And you hear all these stories about, you know, for example, the one that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. This, you know, it, it might just mean that I'm, I'm grumpy for some reason, but the story of him helping, uh, I think it was an elderly person in a wheelchair at the airport while leaving the, the NFL scouting combine in Indianapolis. And many people in the media were saying, oh my goodness, look at this. You know, Even when the cameras aren't rolling, this guy, he's a good guy. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. You don't think he thinks the cameras are rolling then? He's in Indianapolis. He's leaving the scouting combine. And believe me, I want Winston to succeed. It kills me that we have to talk about this over and over, but he makes me nervous. Regardless, he's pro-ready, good arm. He's my number one quarterback, round one grade. Number two, of course, Marcus Mariota out of Oregon. 
He's 6'4", 222. Just because he's fast, don't let that fool you. He's not a little Mike Vick. He's not a small Johnny Menzel, Robert Griffin. He's big. He's thick. Runs a 4.52, so he's got great athleticism. He can run when he wants to. He can use that to put him open. Mariota's challenge will be using his athleticism correctly. What I mean by that, you don't want to be Robert Griffin. You don't want to pull the ball in and run when your first option is not there. Who you want to be is Aaron Rodgers. You want to pull that ball down, run three or four steps, then plant your feet again. Make a brand new pocket and then throw. That's going to be Mariota's challenge. Now, he's another one of these system quarterbacks. And the term system quarterback is starting to drive me absolutely insane because it's a blanket term and it's a lazy term. It's something that we throw on quarterbacks who are productive in college, but we can't really figure them out. Well, what it means is that at Oregon, the scheme they ran was designed to give him a very good first option. If there were five receivers on the field, four of the receivers would be running routes designed to open up the fifth receiver. So Mariota would get the snap, look up, hit that first guy. If the first guy wasn't open, eh, maybe he'd take off. He's going to need to learn to progress the receivers. Say if he lands on the New York Jets, he's going to have to drop back and look. Is Eric Decker open? No. Is Brandon Marshall open? No. Okay, then you check down. You don't run away. So he needs to learn to do that. He needs to learn to set his feet after he scrambles. I'd love to see him end up somewhere like St. Louis, where he can maybe take a year behind a Nick Foles. I worry about the situation where he does land in New York. Marcus Mariota does not have Twitter. He does not have Facebook, Instagram. I barely know what his voice sounds like. He's very quiet, almost to the point where some people think he's strange. Well, you know, whatever. He values his privacy, and I don't know if New York is the best market for privacy. You know, call me crazy for thinking that, but we'll see. You never know if Chip Kelly is going to jump up in the round. So after Winston and Mariota, that's where it kind of gets a little screwy here with quarterbacks. My number three QB is Bryce Petty out of Baylor. 6'3", 230, his body's fine. Another one of these system quarterbacks, quote-unquote. And he played in a one-read system at Baylor. So, again, can you go through these reads? The thing I love about Petty is that he throws a very, very good ball. He can get it deep, he's got good arm strength, and he steps into his passes. One thing that you see with these system quarterbacks is they'll get the pass and then they'll just stand up straight because they know they only have to throw five, six yards. That's not really the case with Petty. He can set his feet, turn his shoulders, and really step into a football good mechanics. So that means as long as he can progress through reads in the NFL, his arm is going to carry him just fine. So he's my number three quarterback. I like him to go in rounds two or three is where I have him graded. He'll go in round two. He'd be a great pick for someone, maybe even a New Orleans, who's got a quarterback in place for a couple of years still, but would like to start out the development process. Number four, I've got Garrett Grayson out of Colorado State. Now, I've got around, you know, a, a two or three grade on him, too. He's 6'2", 213, not the biggest guy in the world, but big enough. Put up a 4,000-yard season at Colorado State last year. Now, he's got a good arm all over the field. He, can, he improved year to year at Colorado State, started for a few years there. One thing I like about him, he's got experience in the shotgun and under center. So he can take it, drop back. His footwork isn't the cleanest but he knows how to take it and drop back. The thing that I don't like about Garrett Grayson is that he's a bit slow through his through his throwing process. He can get through his reads okay, but with Garrett Grayson, it reminds me a bit of E.J. Manuel. They're completely different quarterbacks, but when he finds his target and decides to throw, his footwork and his release are just a bit slow getting to that receiver. Now that's an issue because if you look at someone like Aaron Rodgers, when he looks up and sees Jordy Nelson open, boom, the football is there. With Garrett Grayson, he looks up and sees the guy open. He starts his release over the top, through, release. By that time, the receiver might be covered again. So he's going to need to speed that up a lot. He's my number four QB. In most drafts, he'd be a five, six, seven QB. This is not a good quarterback draft after the top two. My number five QB, who a lot of people have a bit higher, is Brett Hundley out of UCLA. Not as high on Hundley as most people. I've got a fourth round grade on him. 2014, he completed 69% of his passes, which looks great. 
but that's very, very inflated. Now, he's 6'3", 226, electric playmaker with his legs, and he's got the right body for it. Again, this isn't our G3 with his little kind of flamingo legs that I'm afraid are going to just snap off every time he gets hit. Hundley can lower his shoulder and be okay. Now, he's mobile, 4.6 speed, looks even better on the field. And this isn't just 5, 10-yard speed. He can take it 40 yards. He can break outside. And when he sees a defender coming at him, he's not going to think, oh, okay, I've got enough, let's get out of bounds. He tries to get more, and I like that about him. I like him as a person. I like him in interviews. I like his moxie. But what he ran is called a play-action scheme at UCLA. That's a bit different than what we're talking about here with Baylor or Oregon. A play-action scheme would mostly be him in the shotgun. He'd take the snap, flash a quick play-action to his running back, and then immediately go to his first option. What this does is it freezes the linebackers, the safeties, the cornerbacks, just for a moment, and gives him a very, very easy five-yard pass that a receiver turns up field for him. If he can develop into a pro-style quarterback, the skills are jumping off the page here with Brett Hundley. But he's done nothing in college to show me that he is going to turn into a pocket passer. He just cannot win from the pocket right now. As a long-term project in the third or fourth round, I think he's a fine pick. Some team might fall in love with him and reach for him the second round, which I don't like. The second round is just a a dead zone for quarterback prospects. Look back through the, the list. I'll, I'll post something on the back at punter.com about it in the coming weeks, but it's a laundry list of failed QBs in round two. So those are my top five QBs there. Winston, Mariota, Petty, Grayson, Hundley. For each position, I'm going to give you a bit of a sleeper here to look at. And, and I use the word sleeper lightly. And you should take it lightly because we throw around the word sleeper like, like we've just got this knowledge the scouts don't have. We say, hey, hey, look for this guy. No one else is on him, but I am. That's not the truth. A sleeper means that they have half the skills you need and those skills are dominant. They just need to fill out the rest of their game. And for me, that's Brandon Bridge out of Southern Alabama. 6'4", 230, big body, love the body. He has an absolute rocket arm. I'm talking he could have one of the strongest arms in the NFL right now. But it's all over the place. His accuracy is really thrown off by some shoddy mechanics. But if you grab him in the late rounds, I'm not sure how how late he'd slip. He might be a 5'6", guy. If he makes it undrafted, that would be an incredible signing. But I think someone will take a chance just on his arm. Grab him, try to stash him on a practice squad, keep him as a third QB if your roster allows. Why not? If you're going to grab someone late, get a project, get something to work on. And for me, that's Brandon Bridge. So next up, we're going to look at tight ends. And once again, this isn't a great tight end class at all. It really is not. And the tight end prospect pool just has not caught up with the need that the NFL has. Everybody wants a Jimmy Graham, Rob Gronkowski. Greg Olson, Travis Kelsey, Julius Thomas. But that's not here yet. We're still waiting for the prospect ranks to fill up. So at tight end, my number one guy is Max Williams out of Minnesota. Even then, I have a round two grade on Max Williams. He's 6'4", 250. He put up some decent numbers in 2014, 569 yards with eight scores. Now, he ran a 4.7 at the Combine. I was expecting better, but he plays faster than that. He's got good burst. You know, when... When you put him in the slot, and this is what allows him to succeed in the slot, he can catch it and pop out of a cut quickly. That will help him be a yards-after-catch tight end instead of kind of a plodding guy that catches it and falls down. So that's good. He's got very good hands, good catch radius. He can really work his feet along the sideline if you want to put him there, which might help him in the red zone. Now, at Minnesota, he was used as a move tight end, which means... He ran a lot of crossing routes that put him wide open. How is he going to deal with coverage when people really get physical with him? When he gets linebackers, big NFL linebackers chipping him? I don't know. So he's athletic. He's the type of tight end people are looking for, but still around two grade. This is not an elite guy. My second tight end, Clive Walford from Miami. I love this guy's name for some reason, but he's 6'4", 258. I've got around, you know, a, a two or three grade on him. He'll probably go in the second. Now, he had a good year with Miami, 676 yards, seven touchdowns. Now, this guy is, he's thicker. He's physical, 
And one thing that's great about him is he can block. Now, the blocking tight end is really, really not in vogue right now. But if you're a power running team and you want a guy that you can keep in there for all three downs, Clive Walford might be your guy. He's got long arms, big hands. He'll be one of these tight ends, you know, almost like Richard Rodgers of the Green Bay Packers last year. I'm trying to think of, of rookie tight ends recently. He'll be great to make a 6, 8, 10-yard catch, big hands, suck it in like a vacuum, but he's not going to break off a big, long run. He really rounds off his roots. I don't think he can run up the seam. But in a tight end class like this, he's the number two. Number three is Devin Funchess out of Michigan. You'll see him as a wide receiver some places. I'm going to keep him as a tight end right now. He's 6'4", 232. He really starred at tight end at Michigan in 2013. He was about to break out, but then they moved him to mostly you know, wide receiver. And the, the line between tight end wide receiver gets blurry here. But in 2014, he had 733 yards, 62 receptions. He was producing. Now, at the scouting combine, he ran a 4.740. At his pro day, he ran a 4.47. The truth lies somewhere in between. The pro day 40s, they get a little inflated. What I love about Funchess is that he can be a great yards-after-catch receiver at tight end. And that really opens up the center of the field. Now, his legs are probably twice the size of my body. It's... It's almost strange to look at. He's got huge, long legs, and he can really drive forward. And if he learns to lower his shoulder and push with those legs, he could really be special. The thing about him is drops, concentration, and position. Is he going to be strong enough to stay at tight end for anything more than passing downs? But then if you move him out to wide receiver, is he going to get shut down? Is he fast enough to get behind someone? Because... You can't just be a guy that makes back shoulder catches and high balls the football. You've got to be able to make slant routes. You've got to run past somebody. You've got to bring more to the table. So you see Funch is compared to Kelvin Benjamin a lot. If that's the case, fantastic. But this league has also seen a lot of 6'4 heavy receivers really fizzle out because they do not have the speed or agility. But still... He's my number three, and he's very athletic. That's what people are looking for. And I think some team will be happy with Funchess if they can get him. At number four here, it gets a bit murky. I've got my number four as Jeff Hewerman out of Ohio State. This guy is six foot five, two fifty four, big hands. I really like his body. Now he had a good twenty thirteen season, really good, but he played hurt in twenty fourteen, went through some quarterback changes, and really did not produce much at all. He ran a 4.8 in the 40-yard dash. I think he's a bit quicker than that on the field, and he can stretch the seam of the field. He can get in between those safeties, make the -the over-the-shoulder catch. He's really not a good blocker. I don't like his blocking, but he's one of these guys that you can move outside in the red zone, high point the football, run a slant. He's raw, but if you get him in the third, fourth, fifth round, I've got a 4-5 grade on him. Someone might grab him in four. I think a team will be happy. Number five, I have James O'Shaughnessy. Illinois State, 6'4", 245. I've got a similar grade on him, a 4.5 grade. Now, he ran a 4.68, and he's a real quick accelerator, just kind of like Mac Will- Max Williams. He can really pop out of a cut. Now, O'Shaughnessy has really good hands. He can jump up and grab the football. Very productive. And I think he will translate to the NFL game quite well. His struggle, again, can he block? Is he strong enough? As you see these tight ends becoming more athletic, you're losing the traditional tight end position. All of these guys want to play outside now. They want to be tight ends because that's the sexy position, but they want to play outside. O'Shaughnessy's going to struggle with blocking. You're not going to want to have him in on running downs at all. So that's my top five there. Williams, Walford, Funchess, Herman, O'Shaughnessy. One guy I do like just on the outside that I'll mention, Blake Bell out of Oklahoma. He'll be a late round project pick. This guy's six foot six, two fifty two. You might recognize the name because he was a three year starter at quarterback, and he had the nickname of the Belldozer. He's massive, and he was kind of a short yardage specialist at quarterback. The QB sneaks, or or he'd rush, and he would run people over. He would ruin lives on the football field. But he didn't really have much of a pro projection. They switched him to tight end. 
this season. He didn't produce much, but the bodies there, football IQs there, they might go for it. And then at tight end, since we haven't really caught up to this position yet, there's always going to be a deep sleeper at tight end. We had a question from one of our listeners here, from Ryan Andrews from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Ryan asked, who is the next star at tight end that's going to come from a basketball background? Which former basketball player is going to break out here? Because basketball to tight end, it started with Tony Gonzalez, and it's going to keep happening. And I've got two names here, and they're two very different players. First up is Michael Pruitt. He was a high school basketball player, didn't really play in college, but this guy runs a 4.58. Great hands. He produced in college. Now he's only six foot two, so he'd be more of a you know a slot tight end. But he's fast. He's quick. If you get him in the right system, maybe even someone like the New Orleans Saints, that might be interesting. But in a system where he can fly around, maybe on some turf, Michael Pruitt would be a great pick late in the draft. But one that I really, really have my eye on is a prospect that is 27 years old. His name is Gene Sifrin. He's 6'5", 245 pounds, out of UMass. This guy has 11-inch hands. For those of you who aren't up to date with hand measurements, which if you're not, congratulations, you shouldn't be, 11-inch hands are massive hands. Runs a 4.840, so he's fast enough. Now, Sifrin, he dropped out of high school in 2005, later earned his GED, but he was working to support a girlfriend, to support a son. He played some low-level low level, sorry, college basketball, bounced around some different low-level schools, then ended up at UMass to play football. A coach noticed him. It was lucky. It was a shot. He's played one year of college football. He's 27 years old, but still, in one season, 42 receptions, 642 yards, six touchdowns. Some team is going to give this guy a chance, whether it's in round seven or undrafted, Gene Sifrin. Remember that name because he's one of these guys, just maybe, just maybe he could. Because if he can learn to box players out, if he can learn to go up and high point the football in the red zone, he could be an interesting option. So keep an eye out for him. Now we're going to move on and we will go through offensive line. We'll go through this one a little quicker because not everybody's in love with offensive line prospects. And this is a strange O-line draft. There's really not that elite left tackle that you can't miss. Most drafts have that left tackle at the top, a top five pick, not this one. My top prospect out of Iowa, Brandon Scherf. He's at the top of most boards. He is going to profile as perhaps a right tackle. I love him as a guard. Just like Zach Martin to the Cowboys, he can come in road great at guard. He could be a top ten guard in the NFL. But then again, do you want to spend a high pick on that? The earliest I can see him going might be to the St. Louis Rams at number 10. New York Giants at number 9, also right ahead of them. That would be a great pick for them. But he is a professional football player already playing in college football. He's a grown man. He's country strong. He'll have no problem in the NFL, I don't think. On to my number 2 offensive line prospect. I like Andrus Pete out of Stanford. I'm higher than him on most people. And he's a prospect that people just keep thinking themselves out of. He's six foot seven. He's smart. He comes from a pro style offense. Extremely high football IQ. Great character. Strong. He might profile just as a, as a right tackle himself. But if there's a team looking for a right tackle, Andrus Pete's one of these players that I feel comfortable just taking and plugging in and not worrying about him for six, eight, ten years. He might look great on a team like the Cleveland Browns, looking to shore up their offensive line with a safe pick. Number three, I have got DJ Humphreys out of Florida. And this guy really shot up draft boards. And the reason that he is here above Lael Collins is because I believe Humphreys can play left tackle. So that instantly doubles his value. My worry about him is that he played all season at 280 pounds at Florida. That's not good. He bulked up to just over 300 at the scouting combine. Everything I've read says that he's still keeping his movement good at that weight, so that's encouraging. The big thing about him is foot movement. He's got great technique with his feet. He can kick out on the edge. He'll keep up with speed rushers, and that's the important part. In the NFL, you're going to be seeing guys like Bruce Irvin, Clay Matthews, these guys that are just lightning off the edge. 
You need to be able to kick back and pick them up. DJ Humphreys can do that. My number four guy, Lyle Collins. He's too good to be a number four guy here. I really like Collins, but this is where I have him slotted. Again, he's likely a right tackle or guard. Out of LSU, he's mean, he is a bully, and I absolutely love it. He's a bully in the good sense, not in the Richie Incognito, you get nauseous looking at the guy sense. He's a finisher in the running game. He can get up to the second level. His issue is he does have some problems with his technique, and he can get off balance. Just like I was talking about with Humphreys, I don't know if I want Lael Collins on the edge taking on an Irvin or a Matthews. I'm not sure if he can kick back in time and keep his balance. But if you want to put him inside, left or right guard, do that for one season, two seasons, work on him, and then I think you've got a fantastic right tackle. And my number five offensive line prospect, TJ Clemmings out of Pittsburgh. This is another mean guy and another guy I really love. He started out at Pittsburgh as an offensive lineman, so he's got some really heavy, powerful hands. You'll hear that term a lot in the next few weeks, heavy hands. That means they're powerful. When they hit someone, they hit them heavy. He's got technique issues himself, but I like him in the run game. I think if you develop him, you're going to have to hide him on your offensive line a little more. You don't want to give him as much as you're going to give Collins because he's still raw. Offensive line's new to him. Most of these guys have been playing offensive line since they were 10, 12 years old. Clemmings has not. But as a project, it's there. All of these guys are first-round picks for me. So now let's take a look at running back here. Number one, a lot of people have Melvin Gordon. I still have Todd Gurley. Out of Georgia, 6'1", 222. Now, as you all know, Gurley, he tore his ACL in 2014. But this guy is going to come back just as strong, you know, barring any setback. Apparently, he's way ahead of schedule. Now, he tore his ACL in November and is expected to be back around opening day. Adrian Peterson tore his ACL in December, so a month later, and he came back and broke the league in half. Don't expect that. That's a bit ridiculous. I don't know if we'll ever see that again. But Gurley can definitely impact this year for the majority of the season. And he's a great athlete. He holds the Georgia record for the 60-meter hurdles. That's exciting. Now, he's tough to tackle. He's decisive. He sees a hole. Boom, he's into it. But he can also receive. He can catch the football. And because of this injury, because of you know an ankle injury he had the year before, if you're looking for a positive, there's a lot of tread left in his tires. And for a running back that runs hard, that's a good thing. So Todd Gurley's at number one, round one pick. Melvin Gordon's my number two running back, also a first-round grade on him out of Wisconsin. 6'1", 215. When you hear somebody refer to him as an upright runner, just roll your eyes. It's fine to be an upright runner as long as you do it right, which is what Gordon does. He ran a 4.52, but he's faster than that. He averaged 7.6 yards per carry across 2013-2014. Now, Wisconsin's notorious for producing running backs that have inflated stats because they've got some grown men on their offensive line every single year. Melvin Gordon breaks that mold a bit, though. I think he's a little more special than the other guys. His issue will be can he produce with inside running, and I mean, you know, going between the guard and the center, right up the gut, can he get three, four yards at a time doing that, which will allow him to kick it outside when he wants to. Because if he starts to kick it outside every time, he's toast. He's got to develop the inside game. But I think that he can be a real factor in the receiving game too. It improved towards the end of 2014, and just from watching games from the start of the year, the end of the year, I liked what I saw a lot more at the end. So if he can chip in 20, 30 receptions, that's big value too. A worry about him is blocking. Is he going to be able to block for the quarterback? If he goes to a team with a star quarterback that's getting blown up, he's going to be on the bench. So he's got to work on that. But Todd Gurley, Melvin Gordon, for all you fantasy football hawks out there, keep an eye on them. If they fit on the right team, if they get on a good team, which they should, what I really like about their their uh, their draft stock here is that they could fall to the back end of the first round, which is where the good teams are. So that could be really exciting. Keep an eye on those guys. My number three running back here is Tevin Coleman out of Indiana. I have a round two grade on Tevin Coleman. Now, he's a north-south guy, and he came seventh in Heisman voting this year. He went over 2,000 yards. He's 5'11", 206. Not the biggest guy in the world, but certainly big enough. 
He's really, really agile. Violent cuts he makes on the field. Jump cuts. The only thing with him is that he needs to be a little more creative, a little more patient. Everything is not a sprint. Everything's not a race. Look at Levon Bell. Levon Bell run. Levon Bell, sorry. He runs at my speed behind the line of scrimmage. He's out for a stroll. Then he sees the hole, and boom, he's gone. That's what Tevin Coleman needs to work on, because he takes the ball and is dead straight ahead, no matter what the hole says. He can't do that, but huge talent. Number four running back I've got here is Amir Abdullah out of Nebraska, 5'9", 205, also around two grade. He's a small guy, but I absolutely love him. He's got these thick, strong legs. He can drive forward. He's got plus burst. He's patient, very good vision, and he's a great receiver as well. If this guy gets onto the right team in a starting role, he could be a big, big surprise in year one. And out of the entire draft class, he's probably one of the best human beings, which I know we don't really care about in the NFL. Some teams will probably give him a red flag just for being a good guy, but incredible character. Now, he does fumble a bit. He's got small hands, and if teams aren't comfortable with his size, you know, this guy is rocked full of muscle, and there's no room to make him bigger. So if teams want a bigger back, he'll be off the board. But for the right team, if you can get him in a zone running scheme, man, he could surprise. My number five back is Jay Ajayi out of Boise State. Six foot tall, 221. I've got a round two grade on him as well. So I've got five running backs graded in the first two rounds. Now this guy is strong. He's sure-footed. You know, if he meets an arm tackle, they bounce off of him. He needs to be met head on to be brought down. He pushes the pile forward, downhill runner. He'll punish people at the second level. But what's amazing about Ajayi is he's an incredible receiver out of the backfield. Absolutely fantastic receiver. Now, there's some questions about him. He was arrested in 2011 for stealing a pair of sweatpants. How how serious do you want to take that? I don't know. Another thing with Ajayi is his vision isn't always the best. What I mean by that is sometimes if he's running and he sees a hole and there's a defender in that hole, he'll look to run over the defender. He seeks out contact a lot. How's that going to help him hold up in the NFL? Is he going to get driven back a little more in the NFL? Yes. We'll see how that goes. But this is a guy you could plug in as a starter day one, and you can grab him in the second round. I'd love him to go to the Dallas Cowboys. I'd absolutely love that. Now, outside of my top five here, I've got a few guys to keep an eye on. It absolutely kills me to keep Duke Johnson out of my top five. Duke Johnson out of Miami, 5'9", 207. I've got a second, third round grade on him. This guy's a lightning bug. He's a home run threat. He puts butts in seats. He's fun to watch. Someone will take him. If they can plug him into his own running scheme, he'll be real exciting because he can hit the hole. Another guy I've got a round three grade on, David Johnson out of Northern Iowa the fantasy football hotbed of northern Iowa. Guy 6'1", 224, used to be a wide receiver. He's an incredible, incredible receiving back out of the backfield. This guy could come in if he can learn to block the quarterback. He can be a great third down back, maybe see some carries. But then the one guy I've got my my eye on in this entire draft, we all have our, our draft crushes. One of mine's David Cobb out of Minnesota. 5'11", 229, I've got a third round grade on him. Some people are higher, some people are lower. But this guy, he reminds me of someone like a, maybe an Alfred Morris. Someone like that. He hits the hole, he's simple, he falls forward. When there are four yards to gain, he gains five. If you give him one yard, he gains two. It's not a sexy pick. It's not a pick that's going to sell a million jerseys. But... David Cobb could quietly turn into a producer next year. Slap him on a team with a bit of a questionable starter at running back, a guy you're not too sure of. Quietly, he's going to get slid into a starting role somewhere in the next couple years, and I think he's going to produce. He'll be a straight-up, you know, four or five yards every carry. He'll hold his own in the receiving game. He'll get a couple catches. I absolutely love David Cobb. So that's it for running backs there. Gurley, Gordon, Coleman, Abdullah, Ajayi. Keep an eye on Johnson, Johnson, and Cobb. It sounds like a law firm at the bottom of my list here. Hurt in a car? Call Johnson, Johnson, and Cobb. So now we're on to wide receiver. 
And I'll do a top 10 wide receivers here because this is cl- this class is way too good to keep it to five. And everyone's pretty familiar with the top five anyways. That That's boring. So at wide receiver, my top guy is Amari Cooper. I jumped on this Kevin White bandwagon for a bit, but looking back, I'm disappointed because I shouldn't have. Amari Cooper, this guy is 6'1", 211 pounds, but somehow he gets pigeonholed as this small, simple receiver because he's not this 6'3", Kevin White guy. He's just as fast as Kevin White, if not a hair faster. He runs in the 4.3s. He broke college football in half last year, and he's playing on Alabama, so that's not a joke. He's not playing against, you know, Southern Northern Iowa State Community College. He's playing against real men up there. And he put up huge numbers, and he was the entire focal point of that offense. I love his route running. Absolutely love it. And that's what sets him apart. That's why I think he'll be a huge producer from day one. If he lands on the Oakland Raiders, eh, that's okay. It might take a a year or two to really get the number. But if he falls to someone like the Chicago Bears, I think he can have a massive year. Thousand yards. Whatever receiver does go to the Bears... Brandon Marshall took 150 targets out of town with him. All Sean Jeffrey needs a guy like Amari Cooper across from him to dominate short, intermediate routes, draw coverage so he can go deep. I absolutely love Amari Cooper. I think he's the number one receiver in this draft. And I think that he has a chance to be the next you know, Mike Evans, maybe the next Odell Beckham, Sammy Watkins for fantasy football purposes. He'll be a real contributor next year. So then my number two, of course, is Kevin White out of West Virginia. Don't get me wrong. This guy's 6'3", 215, runs in the 4.3s. He's a first-round pick eight days a week. The thing with him, he he was a, a junior college transfer to West Virginia. He put up great numbers last year. I love his tape. But part of me always wonders about that. Part of me wonders, hey, why weren't you this high school phenom? Where were you for the first couple of years, you know? If you're just peaking right now, I don't really have as big a body of work. But regardless, this guy has Julio Jones potential. And he's the true number one outside threat that every team wants. Six foot three seems to be this sweet spot. Once you're six foot three, people look at you and say, oh, there's a starting wide receiver. There's a wide receiver one. That's not the smartest thinking ever, but it is the thinking. And Kevin White fits that mold. Wide receiver one. My third guy here, Devontae Parker out of Louisville. He was uh, Teddy Bridgewater's top option there last year, the year before this past one. Again, he's 6'3", 209. He runs in the 4.4s. He's plenty fast. Devontae Parker has incredible body control. And for those of you listening who are wondering, well, yeah, why does that matter? That matters when he's getting tight coverage. A lot of receivers, if they are in tight coverage, physical coverage, Their arms go down. They get shut down. Devontae Parker is great at even making a small jump, just jumping a foot off the ground, wrapping his body around a cornerback, and grabbing it on the other side. That means that even when he's up against a top-notch cornerback, I still trust him. I still want to throw to him. He's great, great at high-pointing the football. I like him in the red zone. He just needs to get a little bit stronger. Because with that body control, if he puts on a little more muscle, he could be really scary. Number four, I've got Jalen Strong out of Arizona State. This guy's another big one, 6'2", 217. Now, I was expecting him to run around a 4.6 at the scouting combine. He ran a 4.44, really jumped him up the board. And this guy's really strong. He can beat press coverage. I even like him in the slot a bit because I think that he can catch it and you know out-muscle some people, move the chains. Again, he's a bit raw, though. You want to see him working on his rope running. Can he get those roots down? Uh, He might need a year. But if you draft him as a second or third option, let him grow. Hit him with some open passes. I think he can make some plays for you. I see him going in between 15 and 25, probably. He could even jump up a bit earlier. Now for number 5, down to number 10, this is where it gets a little more mixed. Everyone's 1 to 4 is pretty much the same. But at number 5, I've got Doriel Green Beckham. Out of Missouri... He was at Oklahoma last year, but didn't play football. The fact that Doriel Green Beckham did not go back to school blows my mind. Because if he went back and even had a good year, he'd be a top 10 pick. 
but here he is. And if I'm 20 years old and you offer me first-round NFL money, I'm going to take it. Let's be honest. This guy's 6'5", 237, Calvin Johnson body. That's the easy comparable. 4.49 speed. So he's not just a big lug on the outside. He can move. My problem with him, on top of all the off-field stuff, on top of the fact he hasn't played a lot of football, is in his limited tape, I want to see him throwing people around. I want him to pick up a cornerback and throw him across the field and say, throw me the football, because I just ate that guy's lunch. But he doesn't. He gets his lunch eaten by these little guys, and I don't understand it. He gets pushed around by cornerbacks. He needs a mean streak on the field. Because if he gets physical, if he starts to lay a shoulder into the cornerbacks covering him, this guy can dominate. This guy's probably got a higher ceiling than anyone in this draft. He's got a real small, and I mean a really, really, really small chance to reach that ceiling. But it's there. So if he can do something with that, if the right team can get him, I'd love Baltimore to grab him and then have Steve Smith take him under his wing, but... I've got a round one grade on Doyle Green Beckham. His character concerns might slip him to number two, but the skill here is way too much. One team out of the 32 NFL teams are going to fall in love with this and think, oh my God, I'm going to be the one that turns this into something special. So that's my top five there. Cooper, White, Parker, Strong, Green, Beckham. Looking at my number six here, I have Brashad Perryman out of Central Florida. He is currently the bell of the ball after running a 4.24 at his pro day. The exciting thing is that he's not one of these little scat guys. He's 6'2", 212. Big body, long strider, huge speed. Now, he's a deep threat. He can also high point the football. Of course, you know, as you can probably assume with him, the negative is that he is not a crisp route runner. He tries to outrun people. You know, he plays like a game of backyard football with your friends. You look around your team, you see who your fastest buddy is, and you just tell him to run in a straight line. That's what Perryman did. I'd love to see Perryman land in the Philadelphia Eagles. I think Chip Kelly would have a field day with that guy, not to mention their, their need at receiver. But if a team can build up his routes, maybe get him on a slant, some crossing routes, some deep routes. I think he can be special because there are not many defenders on earth that can defend this guy speed-wise. So he's going to make a team happy. I've got a round one grade on him. He'll be, I, I think he'll land in the 20s, right towards the back end of the round. My number seven guy, I actually have Nelson Aguilar out of USC. This guy's six foot tall, 198 pounds, runs a 4.42. That's all fine. A lot of people have him ranked a bit lower because he's a slot receiver. But that's old thinking. The slot receiver works now. The slot receiver is an important receiver in today's NFL. I've got a round 1-2 grade on him, a 1-2, slash but this guy's quick. He runs good routes, which is important. I can't stress that enough coming out of college. I need a receiver that runs good routes. These guys that come out from a, you know, from a system where they've been the star and all they need to do is run in a straight line... A lot of the time, it does not translate. But Nelson Aguilar, he can run some pro routes. He's good yards after the catch. He can take it, turn up field. He's a plus return man, so if you're looking for some return abilities, this is the guy. But again, slot receiver. I understand that keeping him out of the top 10, 15, 20. But at the very basement of the first round, early second round, this guy can be a great third option, especially if you've already got another couple of receivers in place. So after Aguilar at 7, I've got Philip Dorsett at number 8 out of Miami. 5'10", 185, 4.3 speed. I've got around 2 grade on Philip Dorsett. Over half of the catches he made in 2014 went for over 25 yards. This guy's a straight-up deep threat. Again, can he run routes? We don't know. There's a theme at the bottom of this top 10, and it drives me nuts. But this guy can operate out of the slot. He's quick enough to be in the slot. He's not just a, a long strider in a straight line. He's got quickness. So start him in the slot, send him deep sometimes, almost like a Torrey Smith when he was with the, the Baltimore Ravens, now with the 49ers. But I like Dorsett. I really like Dorsett. He's going to make the right team happy in round two. 
Right after him, we've got a similar player, Devin Smith out of Ohio State. Six foot tall, 196, 4.4. Just like Dorsett, over half of his receptions last year went over 25, and he's got quick speed. By that, I mean he gets to his top speed right away. He can stutter mid-route and take off. I really like Devin Smith as a deep threat. Another good thing about him, he's a plus-plus gunner on special teams. Special teams aren't the most important thing to everyone, but that will put him ahead of some other receivers. The thing about him is his hands cannot be trusted. If a quarterback hits Devin Smith 50 yards down the field and he drops it, that quarterback's not going to throw to him for a long time. It's one thing to drop a little slant route, but if you're going to drop deep routes, mm, that's going to land you on the bench. That's going to land you in a doghouse really quick. He's not a natural catcher of the football, and that's going to hurt him if teams want him to do more than just be a home run guy. But if he polishes that up, big time prospect. I've got a second round grade on him. All of these players, I've got, you know, I've got 10 receivers here. My lowest ranked one is number 10 here, which I've got a, a 2 slash 3 on. And my number 10 guy is Tyler Lockett out of Kansas State. I absolutely love Tyler Lockett. I've got him ranked here. Some people have him ranked lower. He's 5'10", 182, 4.4 speed. He's not massive. That's fine. Don't get worked up about these size numbers. He runs plus routes out of the slot. Huge football IQ. He's smart. He's a pro already. Good enough speed. Great producer at Kansas State. He's tough. His coach will love him. His quarterback will love him. His wide receivers coach will love him. The thing about him is, you know, his size, it's troubling cornerbacks can kind of eat him up when he is in press coverage and that's going to be a bit of a problem for him but Tyler Lockett would be a great third option and he's one that could really produce in 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 year one perhaps if he goes towards the very back end of round two to a quality team keep an eye on him because that could be absolutely fantastic for him so that's my look at wide receivers here again we run through it's Cooper White Parker Strong and Green Beckham at number five. Starting at six, we have Brashad Perryman, Nelson Aguilar, Philip Dorsett, Devin Smith, ending with my boy, Tyler Lockett, at number ten. So that's how the offense shakes out for me. But believe it or not, my word is not even close to the gospel. Tell me what you think, especially with some of these positions that are really fuzzy in around the three, four, five rankings. Who do you like at tight end? Who do you like at quarterback? Who do you like between Todd Gurley and Melvin Gordon? Because that's a big question, and it's a damn interesting one, because they're different running backs. So it's not only who do you like as a player, it's who do you like as a playing style. Then tell me what you like about the wide receivers. Do you think that Doriel Green Beckham can do something? Him and Jameis Winston... I, I almost think of them similarly. They're, they're, there's a great chance that in five years, they could be an incredible NFL player, dominant. There's also a chance in five years that they will not be in the NFL. Doriel Green Beckham's got a way bigger chance of not being in the NFL in five years. He should be at Oklahoma next year. It kills me. But he's going to be an exciting project. And you better believe I'm going to be watching his games, especially through the preseason next year. Because if he can put it together, he's one of the most special physical specimens in this entire draft class. So as always, reach out over Twitter, over Facebook, email, comment section on the website. Send me a a letter, a messenger dove. I'm sure the iPhone has some new form of communication I haven't found yet. Get in touch with me at thebackuppunter.com. Let me know what you think. And coming up next week, I'm going to be going through the defensive prospects, position by position, just like this, my top five with some sleepers all along the defense. And I'll get to some of my favorite prospects like Malcolm Brown, Malcolm Brown out of Texas. And there's some positions just like inside linebacker and, oh, my God, safety. I don't think I've seen a class at a position as bad as this safety class in a long time. So we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about what that means. Does that mean cornerbacks are going to have to be drafted and converted? 
It's not the right time to be looking for a safety, just like it's not the right time to be looking for a tight end. So again, my name is Keegan Matson. This has been the Backup Punter Podcast, Episode 4. Hopefully the first four of many, many more. And I thank you again for joining. It does mean a lot to me that you take the time each and every week, whether you're on the couch, whether you're on the treadmill, in the car, on an airplane, thank you for choosing the Backup Punter Podcast. Send in your questions. Be in touch. Subscribe on iTunes. Subscribe on Stitcher. It's just over two weeks until the NFL draft, just under five months until opening kickoff. It'll be here before you know it. Mm -hmm.